with John Padini about Royal Raymond Rife and what he accomplished with the help of some pretty amazing friends. Go ahead. So anyway, Jeff, um, Dr. Strecker and myself wanted to put this thing to task. So the microscope ended up at my lab, and uh, we we gave John Crane enough money to get himself out of trouble, like on his back rent and stuff like this. And he, uh, of course, he didn't tell us everything, but we'll get into that. And uh, Strecker, Strecker brought in the very first day, Strecker brought in an incubator uh, for uh, culturing the viruses. Mm-hmm. We set up the microscope only to discover that, you know, we had to make prisms fit inside there because those were gone. They're, they were nowhere to be found. Now, the prisms were the key to the microscope because Rife actually directed the monochromatic light with which he illuminated what he was looking at through a series of prisms. Correct. And they were not there. Right, so they were a, not there. You got an automobile with no engine, so to speak, <laughs> or almost. So, so uh, John, John Crane's first task was to sit at the drafting table and... Um, draw out the pieces so that we could go back in the machine shop and, uh, you know, produce all these brass pieces to hold the prisms. Then the next task... Where were the prisms? Did he have them? No. So you had to recreate the prisms? Yes, we had to go oh. and buy... We had to go to a place that sold optics, and we had to get, you know, prisms that were precise size, so we had to buy those. Were you able to duplicate... What Rife used in that microscope, or no. you had to guesstimate to the best of your ability. And where the hell were they? What was? What did Crane say? The prisms. That where did they go? Well, <laughs> that's that's a good question, Jeff, because those those prisms were were made by Rife, and they were quartz. All right, they were solid quartz because this. Microscope is nothing more than a light interferometer. Uh, in other words, when you split the beams of light and you get the colors, you interfere the colors with each other, and as you do that, the specimen lights up. So it's nothing more that, than what I'm going to be talking about here is an interferometer, but it's mm-hmm. a light interferometer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... Um, we went ahead and we manufactured all these pieces and parts, and we put them in the microscope. And of course, uh, we used the original uh, Rife illuminator, which was that patented device that uh, you know uh, multiplied the light, light you know, fifteen thousand times. Uh-huh. And of course, that was workable, so we got that to work. Now, keep that in mind, too. We're talking about the late 1920s, early 30s. Dr. Reif was able to figure out a way to multiply light incredibly. So he could get far more. I mean, how do you multiply light? But he did it. Well, he Uh, did it very uniquely. He uh, took an automobile bulb and uh, hooked that to a transformer so he could vary the light source. mm -hmm. And then that got projected on the steepest parabolic you've ever seen in your life in the bottom of this thing. (laughs) And then, of course, through one of the thickest quartz lenses that you've ever seen. And uh, that, you know, made a needle point of light, which was cold light, because uh, normally you would use a light that's driven from a power source underneath a microscope, and you always have to worry that you're going to boil the specimen away. You follow me? Sure. And uh, but life, uh, Rife uniquely developed this light, which put out a cold beam of light, and there was no heat involved. But as Crane and I soon found out, the light never got up through the microscope to the eyepiece because the, he didn't know the secret to the microscope. Hmm. And All right. Yeah. You follow me? I do. There was still something missing. So this mm-hmm. this takes me to a point when I started to question Crane about I thought that you knew everything about 
have this microscope and see John Crane could come to life, Jeff, and then he could go to sleep as fast as he came to life. Hmm. In other words, when there was a difficult question or Strecker was asking a question, uh, Crane would mysteriously get tired or it'd be time to eat. <laughs> you wouldn't get anywhere. So the best thing to do was just proceed with what Crane was having us do, which was try to rebuild this microscope, of course, which uh, was futile because he didn't really know, I don't think, how the microscope actually worked. So he, he, he could uh, take it apart, put it back together within reasonable tolerances, but yeah. he never knew how it worked. Right. So he developed his own theories of projection microscopes, and wow. uh, because that's how Strecker mm -hmm. found out was by there were a few doctors that bought a couple of uh, you know, John Crane's microscopes, and mm -hmm. they they were good up to five thousand, ten thousand power. Mm -hmm. And so Strecker was very impressed, and was more impressed when he seen this virus number three microscope. And uh, believe me, Jeff, um, I don't think, you know, with all the work that we did and everything, I don't think that John Crane actually knew what was missing from the microscope. I think it had been removed before Rife entered the picture. Uh -huh. You follow me? Because John Crane ended up with Rife's drafting set, you know, that he bought in a, in a pawn shop. That's how they became friends. Hmm. So I think that, um, and this is just my opinion, Jeff. A pawn shop. Yeah. Go ahead and finish your thought. Yeah. Um, I was, I was having difficulty with believing what he was trying to build there because I said, well, if the light goes up here, John, and it goes through this prism, then it has to bounce over to the next prism, and then it has to go up here and then bounce again and go back. I said, there's got to be something missing here. Oh, no, there's nothing missing. Well, what was missing, Jeff, was the adjustment piece. You know, we find all this out in the end, the adjustment piece that adjusts the length of in the barrel where these prisms actually went. Uh -huh. You follow me? Uh-huh, yeah. And I think if we would have had that piece, that we would have seen something through this microscope. You know, but in the meantime, what Strecker and I did is Strecker brought in a microscope, and I went and purchased a three thousand dollar microscope, and we were getting ready to do these experiments with his his signal generators. You know that he was selling. In the meantime, so I mean th that's where that part you know, ends up is we could not get that microscope to work. How many months did you waste? <sighs> Four or five months. Yeah. You know, and that was day in and day out. And, but, uh, but for those of you thinking about why did they spend that much time, you have to understand that Dr. Bob Strecker and, and scientist John Bedini were literally working on touching and holding and trying to bring back to life the most important medical research instrument Probably of our age, and mm -hmm. to this to this day, we cannot observe live viruses like no, Wright yeah. did. Uh, electron microscopes. Some of you say yes. Well, that's true. They can't see them, but they're dead. Right. And to watch them in a living state, and then to subject them to various different frequencies.